the, this sort of uh, methods lecture is uh, hopefully to get into into the weeds and uh, talk about some of the the uh, advantages of the of different approaches, the disadvantages of different approaches, how to choose. And we're looking forward to it. It's a really lovely uh, lovely opportunity to hear about how it ha how it all happened. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I think many of you just heard uh, this, you know, my, my, my earlier lecture. Um, there's going to be a little bit of repetition here um, for those of you who didn't, um, but I'm going to jump through. So just by way of a brief introduction, this, these are the, the same slides from a, a, uh, about an hour ago. Um, we're interested in this project in... Uh, testing whether we can use um, resting state fMRI to uh, rethink the way we um, the way we approach this question of diagnostic heterogeneity and uh, and subtyping in depression. Um, I, we think the same approach might also be useful. This isn't probably specific to depression. Many psychiatric diagnoses are, are heterogeneous conditions. Um, we're focused here on depression, um, but uh, you might imagine substituting um, uh, other syndromes as well. Um, the, the problem is illustrated well by, uh, by this listing of uh, the symptoms that we use to diagnose a major depressive episode um, based on the DSM. Um, as I mentioned before, you can, have, uh, you can meet criteria for this diagnosis when you have five or more of these nine symptoms, and that means there's at least 256 unique different ways you can present to your doctor and still get this diagnosis of a major depressive episode. Um, and I think it stands to reason, it's not controversial, all, uh, all, most investigators pretty much agree that, uh, that not all people with depression are alike. Um, uh, symptoms may be important, um, but uh, biological substrates may be um, more important in, um, in, in, in defining uh, uh, stable subtypes um, that, that we can use to learn something about uh, mechanism. Um, so the approach we took uh, was kind of flipping the um, historical approach upside down. Historically, we've relied on uh, uh, clinical symptoms, uh, looking for groups of clinical symptoms that tend to co-occur, um, identifying clusters or subgroups in this way, and then asking whether they are associated with um, particular biological correlates that might have promise as a biomarker. Our approach was to turn that upside down and ask whether there are biological uh, features that tend to co-occur in groups of patients um, if so, can we cluster on that basis, identify subgroups of, of, of patients' putative subtypes, and then ask whether they predict clinical symptoms and, and different uh, treatment response patterns. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, um, now, um, is a, a little bit more detail on uh, the, the methods that we used to, to do this. Um, I, I hope this will be a conversation. Um, I've never given this um, lecture before. Um, it's really kind of more of a... Uh, set of slides um, illustrating what we did in a little more granular detail, il illustrating some of the pitfalls, um, and, uh, and I hope you'll interrupt me um, with, with any questions as we go. Um, I don't necessarily even need to get to the end. Um, but uh, I was talking today with Rose, and um, we, we discussed how this idea actually um, came in part from, well, partly from my experience as a psychiatrist um, in training, uh, being kind of puzzled the way we go about uh, diagnosing depression and other, and other conditions, but also um, from some of the other work we're doing in the lab. Most of my lab um, uses uh, calcium imaging and optogenetics to kind of interrogate how um, prefrontal circuits support learning and memory and how those processes are altered by stress. And one of the things we're interested in in the course of analyzing these data, you see a nice example here. These are um, neurons in the prefrontal cortex, I think it's layer two, three, that are expressing the fluorescent calcium sensor GCAMP6 um, uh, on a synapsin promoter, so this is most neurons in the field of view. Um, so there are a lot of different neurons here. Um, they're lighting up um, when they become active. Um, and uh, there's a lot of evidence that, especially in the prefrontal cortex, that um, neurons are functionally he heterogeneous. They do different things in different contexts. They're, they're, they're probably involved in um, kind of high-dimensional um, coding processes. Um, and so we think a lot about uh, this problem of heterogeneity at the level of single cells um, and how we can use like a data-driven clustering-based approach to identify um, functional su uh, subtypes of, of neurons. 
Um, and um, many of the same methods, as it turns out, um, are applicable um, in the context of, uh, of, of um, thinking about subtypes of depression. Um, and even the data look somewhat similar. Um, you can see the, so, so we have methods for segmenting these images into individual cells. Um, that's what you see. Uh, that's okay. Um, that's what you see um, in that, that, that square um, at, the, at the bottom below the 100 micrometer sign. Um, and then we, we extract uh, time series from each of those regions of interest, from each of those cells. Um, and that's what you see depicted in green, red, blue, and yellow there. Um, and uh, many of the same analytical challenges that we face in, in analyzing this kind of data, they're the same analytical challenges that people face in analyzing fMRI data. Um, we, we think that you see these like calcium transient events where like uh, there's a big upshoot in, in activity and then a slow decay. Um, that's driven by spiking in the cell, but the spiking is occurring on a millisecond time scale. And oh, thanks. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the decay of the calcium transient is occurring over a course of seconds. Um, the bold signal is similar in that way. Um, so uh, many of the methods we use turn out to be pretty interchangeable. I'm sure you'll find that um, you use um, similar analyses, met analysis methods for answering um, different questions. Um, as I said, the question we're interested in here today was whether we could identify um, uh, subtypes of depression um, based on resting state fMRI data. Um, and the, that's what you see depicted here. Um, we, we parcelate the brain. We extract bold signal time series, just like we do with our cells in the calcium imaging data. Um, and here we're asking how each region of the brain is correlated with every other region of the brain that gives us this um, whole brain uh, connectivity matrix you can think of it as. Um, and uh, and we were interested in um, what is abnormal in depression um, and whether different patients with depression exhibit different kinds of abnormalities. So how would you go about like um, figuring that out? Again, we saw this before. We knew we'd need a lot of data. We, collect, we, we begged people to share their data. These are the people who, who made this work possible for, for anyone who wasn't here at the, in the previous hour. I always want to highlight these people so it wouldn't have happened without them. Um, uh, most of the analysis you see comes from 711 subjects, 333 unipolar depressed patients from five different scanners. So this is a pretty big sample um, for fMRI. And we were able to replicate some of the key results in, in a second sample that wasn't initially available to us. Um, yes, please. Much bigger sample sizes are definitely possible. Um, so uh, I emailed every single person who had ever published anything in resting state fMRI and depression. Um, and uh, that was in 2013, um, 2014. Um, there's actually been a lot more published since then. Um, there's also probably like tenfold more data that I know exists and hasn't been published yet. Um, uh, but like these are the people who, who you can imagine, this is something I learned, methods. <laughs> you can imagine if like some stranger um, who you've never heard of um, and uh, who like is a freshly minted PI and you don't know this person at all, um, uh, you're not likely to be um, enthusiastic about giving away your data. I wouldn't be either to someone who I don't know or trust or know anything about. Um, and so developing a relationship um, like this isn't just, you know, this is a theme in science, I think, developing relationships with people um, and uh, giving them reason to believe in you and um, know that you are a, a, a careful scientist who um, uh, respects what they do and isn't out to embarrass them. Um, uh, that's, that's honestly a big factor, I think, uh, for a lot of people. Um, um, that's really important. Um, and uh, I worked really hard on, uh, honestly, most of the people who shared their data with me were people I already knew. Um, there, were, there were a couple of exceptions. Um, but uh, now that like, you know, some of this stuff is out and, um, and uh, people think it's a promising approach, um, we've, uh, we've been a, a, uh, approaching collaborators, a, a lot more collaborators. Um, and so there's a lot of data out there. I would say we currently, in our possession, have something like, uh, 1,500 um, 
not including the people in this study, um, and the all depressed people, so uh, thousands of healthy controls. Um, but there are also many others. Um, we were just talking about the UK Biobank. Um, uh, there, there's a Canadian um, multi-site study. Um, there's a kind of cousin in the States. Um, uh, there are lots of big studies out there with a lot of resonance state fMRI data for people with depression. much less. Um, so uh, Karen and I were discussing this a little bit before. Um, like that's, that's maybe one of the things we're most interested in in my lab is um, scanning people uh, repeatedly as much as possible, as, we, as often as we can get them in there and as much as we can pay for it. Um, um, because uh, depression, you know, it's fundamentally an episodic mental illness. Um, it's defined by periods of low mood interposed between periods of wellness. Um, and I think understanding uh, the mechanisms that contribute to those transitions, like why do some people uh, become depressed and stay depressed for a really long time? Um, others have many short bouts of depression. Um, others have really severe depressions and then they're in remission stably for years and no problems. Um, what, what's going on? What determines like the Th those transitions um, and the stability of a transition. And it it's hard to study that without longitudinal data. Um, uh, there's that. And then just technically um, uh, knowing more about the stability of these fMRI measures over time. We're really interested in that calcium imaging and fire photometry. Um, how do these signals change over time and how stable are they is a critical technical question, I think, to answer. Um, and so we're not the only ones, of course, interested in that. Uh, I think it's an area of, uh, it's a hot topic for the field, but there's not a lot out there yet. So I don't have this data at my fingertips, I do, uh, but I think it's accurate to say that uh, like we do, there is a lot of data out there um, looking at cross-sectional changes over age. So let's, let's scan thousands of people at different ages, um, but we're not scanning the same person um, you know, consecutively. Um, those data sets are like treasure troves um, and they're rare. Um, they do exist um, both uh, like mainly I wanna say in like across childhood, adolescence and young adulthood. I don't know that there's as much like scanning people from middle age into older age, um, uh, but I think yeah, those data are going to be really help, really helpful. Even just in healthy people, you know, like it's a fundamental question. I love like we talked about the the Midnight Scan Club paper. There's this um, paper from Wash U where um, Nico Dosenbach and his uh, collaborators there like they could get um, really cheap or maybe free scanning time uh, at night, and so. They scan themselves repeatedly, like dozens of times, um, at, at, like around midnight, hence the name. Um, and uh, the results are published in Neuron. Really super interesting. I'd recommend you guys check it out. Um, maybe uh, uh, off topic for the conversation today, but um, really important question. Um, OK, so that's the data. This is kind of the overview of the methods. I'm really going to focus on um, so I'm going to try to make this practical for people who are maybe interested in doing this or interested in using these similar methods like uh, canonical correlation analysis, hierarchical clustering, um, machine learning um, prediction. Um, and I, I, I hope I'm, I'm going to try to focus on what I think are like um, important pitfalls, things to avoid and like ways to avoid them in, in an effort to be as kind of uh, generally useful to, the, to, a, to a diverse group of people here who might be interested in neuroimaging but in their own day-to-day -day life be dealing with different data sets. Um, I think the, the general principles definitely apply. Um, keep track of time, it's good. Um, so we started by yeah, we started but with these functional connectivity maps here. Uh, I mentioned this before. We parcelate the brain. Um, we extract bold signal time series from each brain region. Um, we ask how each region is correlated with every other region, and that gives us these heat maps that tell us um, uh, how different brain regions are functionally connected. Warm colors denote positive correlations, the regions that go up and down together, cool colors, um, anti-correlations. Um, and uh, this map is complicated, right? There are many features here um, that have, many of which have nothing to do with depression. So we, need, we knew we needed a method for selecting features. Um, and we, we thought 
um, that we would also probably benefit from a method for reducing the dimensionality of the data. So this basically just means like um, we select features that we think are important and then we try to express them um, maybe a uh, hundred features um, or a dozen features or a thousand features um, in terms of a smaller number of variables um, that turns out to be important for uh, stability and robustness. Um, again, that's uh, dimensionality reduction principles. Um, uh, statisticians have um, known this for a long time. Um, uh, I'm gonna, like I said, um, kind of highlight uh, some of the um, important methodological details um, uh, ways to avoid common pitfalls but in, in getting to those uh, uh, canonical correlation analysis results. Um, and, and one of them, and maybe, maybe the single most important um, in my mind, um, is thinking very carefully um, and, and, and about and controlling for um, artifacts um, in your data, um, data quality issues. Um, grad students in the room are probably, everyone has had this um, conversation with their PI. Um, like, did you actually look at the data that you're analyzing? Did you visually inspect it? Um, does it look like good data or bad data? How do we put numbers on the goodness or badness of the data? Um, and how do we make sure our results aren't being contaminated by bad data, which can both give you false negatives, where like um, there's a real signal to be detected, but you can't detect it because half your data is junk, um, or false positives where you think you discovered something that isn't real um, because the result is being driven by some outlier um, data that, uh, that is um, artifact-based. And in the case of fMRI, and actually this is also applies to calcium imaging, um, motion turns out to be a, a really important artifact. Um, uh, people move. Um, we ask them to sit still in the scanner, but no, one can, no one's perfect. Um, here you see, see in panel B, like a, a low motion subject on top. This is a trace over time of the frame-wise displacement of the person's head. How much does it move in millimeters on each volume? Um, each volume is acquired maybe every couple seconds. Um, you can see this person really doesn't move a lot. Um, the, the mean frame-wise displacement is uh, one twentieth of a millimeter. This person's head is rock solid stable, and we, we try to make it as comfortable as possible for them to, to make that easy. Um, you can see a moderate motion subject in the middle. Um, this person has kind of a higher, uh, higher, kind of a higher baseline level of motion. You can kind of see that, um, and they also have. Um, periods where they jerked their head, where they, 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 they moved, and that's not even a lot, that's still a half millimeter of movement, but they moved kind of substantially there, um, enough that you could probably see them moving their head there. Um, and uh, this person is even higher. Um, so this person has really substantial deviations from baseline, and their baseline is quite high, and there's a lot of deviations. And it turns out, as you'd expect, when someone moves, um, that really alters the bold signal, um, because uh, we don't need to get into why, but it does. <laughs> um, and uh, controlling for motion um, is really important. It's kind of easy if, to conceptualize, I think, like if you're asking how um, different regions of the brain are correlated um, and someone moves their head and that introduces like a deviation in the signal that looks like this um, in every brain region, um, that's not got to do with activity, that's got to do with the fact that they move their head. Uh, but every, if they move a lot, every brain region is going to tend to look like it's really correlated with every other brain region. And that's got nothing to do with the organization of their brain. It's got to do with movement introducing a, a, an, an artifact. And so examining your data for um, motion artifacts uh, and controlling for them is really critical. And I'm not here to tell you that our way is the only or best way, but we thought really long and hard um, and tried a lot of different things. Um, and this way seemed to work well. Um, so, uh, and, and it's not, none of it was invented by us. We're basically just um, adopting what other people have recommended as best, pra best practices, um, especially Jonathan Power, my, my colleague now at Cornell. Um, we, we ask, uh, first of all, we, we censor volumes um, whenever they exceed a threshold. Here the threshold is 0.3 millimeters, it's pretty low. Um, and that, that kind of partially fixes that problem where a person moves their head and every brain region seems to have the same signal. We just, we just discard those, those, those values. Um, you can either interpolate or you can just uh, discard them altogether. Um, uh, we also um, regress the signal on, uh, on measures of motion. Um, so this is a measure of motion frame-wise displacement. Um, you, can, you can break that down into six or 12 measures about how someone like moved X, Y, Z, um, roll, pitch, yaw, like turning their head, uh, the derivatives of those. Um, 
and uh, regressing your signal on um, frame-wise frame -wide measures of motion has been shown to be really helpful. Um, and then uh, furthermore, um, we use uh, a method uh, called uh, ANET ICOR um, for controlling for global signal artifacts like those produced by motion. Um, uh, those things turn out to be really important. And, and then lastly, like we don't include subjects at all um, if they, if after censoring they don't have a lot of volumes left. Um, you, you, the, the signal you're looking at is a, is a low frequency event. It's going up and down really slowly, right? Um, and if you only have like, if it's going up and down uh, once every like 20 seconds and you only have 90 seconds of good data, um, you can imagine that's not going to be a very reliable signal that you're measuring. Um, so those things together um, really helped in, uh, in cleaning up the data. I can also, I don't have the slides here, but I, I, I can tell you, I just say like, look at the bold signal if you're doing fMRI or your calcium imaging trace, look at the functional connectivity data. They look totally different um, and like in, in these pa patients, uh, subjects who move a lot. Okay, um, that's motion. Um, this is basically trying to convince you um, that, our, that we did a good job of controlling for motion. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm uh, not, well, actually, I would say like uh, this kind of quality control analysis as recommended by uh, Jonathan Power and others, I, I would really recommend doing this um, after you've implemented your controls, really persuading yourself and publishing it um, that you, you, you did a good job of controlling for motion. And there's lots of different things you can do, but like one of them is just ask, like uh, in patients, in subjects who move a lot compared to subjects who don't move a lot, um, do you see a lot of functional connectivity differences? Um, and if you do, um, that probably means you're not doing such a good job of controlling for motion. And here you see like basically no correction. There are many, many features that are um, abnormal in the high motion people, it's uh, artifact based. Um, whereas uh, with um, the methods we used here, um, that, that's, that's improved. And there are other things you can do too. Um, uh, selecting the right censoring threshold is probably important. Um, this is a little nitty gritty. Um, people can ask me if they're interested in, in more detail there. Um, yes, please uh, interrupt. I don't wanna talk the whole time. Yeah, so do you mean, are there, I, I, I can imagine two interpretations here. Like one would be like, is there like a negative control where you can say like, uh, if I've controlled for motion well, um, I, I should see um, no motion yeah. effects here. I should just assume you see that very little happening. Yeah, um, and I guess the second thing is maybe like whether uh, you think, um, if there's something related to depression, um, uh, there might be re areas that I think I will see effects and areas where I think I won't see effects. And if I see a lot of effects in the areas that don't make sense, then that might be motion related. Um, we, we, we tried to do a lot of the former, um, like um, largely because I don't think we know enough about depression to, uh, to reliably identify negative control regions. And in fact, our data really bear that out. Like many of the areas that are most abnormal in depression compared to healthy people um, are not areas that make intuitive sense. I don't know what they mean. Um, like there's a lot of like visual cortical areas that, um, that show uh, altered functional connectivity. Visual cortex has not been, you, you, you can like in a just so story kind of way, like um, reason backwards and think, oh, maybe they're like visualizing something different, who knows? Um, but like there's no obvious reason why the visual cortex should be altered. Um, but like, I think these analyses are useful, um, like these, um, for uh, for uh, like what I expect to see is like here and here big motion effects. Um, and if I've controlled for motion well, I I would expect to see no effects. And that is basically what we see. And there's two ways of looking at that: comparing 
low, medium, and high motion subjects or just asking like how to, you're, you're regressing on motion. Um, the other is based on this interesting observation made by m many other individuals that, uh, that um, motion-related artifacts actually vary with the distance um, uh, between the two brain regions. So this gives you some spe like specificity. Um, it kind of makes sense if you think about it, like um, the effect of head motion is going to, uh, on, a, on a correlation is going to be different if the regions under being correlated are far apart versus if they're close together. Um, and it turns out that uh, regions that are close together actually tend to show higher correlations when in a high motion person. Um, regions that are far apart tend to show lower motion correlations. And that we, that's what you see in the, the blue data that's like above expected by chance. These are all like um, higher correlations in in neuroanatomically close areas, these are lower correlations in neuroanatomically distant areas, and we see that that effect largely gets normalized. Um, so again, I, I really de do recommend doing something like that. It doesn't have to be this, but um, do something to uh, validate the assumption that you have controlled for motion. Um, so data quality. Uh, I didn't even talk about signal to noise. That's another thing um, to, to, to examine. Um, uh, Scanner-related differences is a third thing to examine. Um, we could go on and on. It's not super interesting. Um, it's important. Ask me about it at the end if you're interested. Um, I want to make sure I have time to talk about some other maybe more interesting stuff. Um, another thing I would uh, encourage you to do um, is um, before you do something like canonical correlation analysis, uh, um, looking for combinations of connectivity features that predict clinical symptoms um, and maybe then clustering on them, I, I think the very first thing you should do is really convince yourself that there are real correlations between any connectivity features and clinical symptoms. Um, because if they're all spurious, um, like, and, and there's lots of ways you could get spurious results, then th the whole foundation for the work falls apart. Um, and uh, there are lots of different ways you could go about doing this, but um, I think the general theme is you want to look um, uh, you want to create some kind of distribution of what you would expect to find um, just purely by chance using the methods you used to, uh, to identify the features to do the feature selection. And then uh, you want to compare that to what you actually observed um, and, uh, and calculate a probability of, of, of observing what you observed um, uh, 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 by chance and really persuading yourself that there are real correlations here. Um, one way to do that is, is what you see depicted here. Like um, we basically, in a thousand bootstrap replicates where you um, you select a, um, a a portion of the connectivity features um, uh, from a portion of the subjects and you calculate correlations um, in uh, and you can do this in different ways one way might be shuffling um, like people do in calcium imaging a lot um, shuffle uh, the uh, clinical symptom scores um, so that uh, they are they have the same means and standard deviations but they um, they've been randomly assigned to subjects, and so there shouldn't be real correlations there. Um, and wh what you should observe um, is, you know, uh, uh, something, what we usually do observe um, by chance is something um, centered on zero with, with tails, um, and uh, they can, uh, they, there could be big tails or there could be small tails, but what you want to compare um, your results to um, is uh, you, you know, the, the Null distribution, what you'd what you'd expect to get by chance, and compared to what you actually get, um, and that's what you see here across the thousand bootstrap replicates. Um, uh, there are uh, the, the the correlations have been assigned a z value based on the probability of observing them, um, and uh, you can see just by chance in the red line, um, you do get high, some high z values because there's thousands of features here, right? Um, the question is, are we getting more than expected by chance? And that's what you see depicted here. Um, there are um, many connectivity features that exhibit um, consistently across different samples and um, uh, different bootstrap replicates consistently exhibiting um, higher correlations than you'd expect by chance. And you can see they vary a little bit by clinical symptom. Um, but uh, all of these are the 95% confidence intervals. Um, all of them are, are way different from zero, right? Um, and when we're, this, when we're talking about like uh, four or five percent of connectivity features from 33,000, um, that's uh, lots, right? Um, thousands of, of, of connectivity features. There's a really strong signal here. Um, this is another way of, of, of estimating it, uh, like looking at the uh, effect size um, um, by comparing what you would expect to get by chance and what you actually observe. And um, you can see for some of them, you know, it's around zero, but for many of them, 
Um, it's it's a, a Cohen's D reflective of what has historically been called by convention like a moderate to large effect, like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, um, 0.65 sometimes. Um, there are real effects here. Um, so do that first, convince yourself that it's real. Um, I also wanna highlight um, something else that, uh, that links back to what I was saying about data quality. Um, so another way of asking this, you, you, I, I told you you could shuffle your clinical symptoms and, um, and ask what you'd expect to observe by chance if there were no real correlations. Um, another way of getting at whether the pre-processing decisions, um, whether data quality, pre-processing, controlling for scanner-related differences, whether they matter, um, is uh, by doing something that you think, uh, so doing nothing, or doing something that you think isn't the right way to do it. Um, and, uh, and, and looking at what, what impact that has on the uh, number of significant correlations that you, that you observe here. Um, and this, this analysis was motivated by a, a preprint that was published recently, which um, uh, purported to uh, try to replicate um, what we did in the Drysdale paper, but um, uh, they did some different things. Um, and uh, I, I think it was just, um, uh, I don't think it, I think it was just kind of overlooking um, some some things that we think are important and they may not think are important, um, mostly related to pre-processing. Um, uh, for example, the, uh, this particular study had uh, about 190, 187 people um, from uh, four or four different scanners, um, and no healthy controls, um, and and so you're, we're talking about maybe 40 people per scanner, whereas uh, our analysis had a lot more people per scanner. Um, we also controlled for scanner-related differences. We also controlled for um, signal to noise. Um, our motion artifact controls were different. Um, and importantly, our clinical sample was also different. And for those of you doing clinical work, I, I think this is also a super important thing to think carefully about. Um, so um, if you want to know whether there are stable relationships between uh, connectivity and symptoms um, in like one sample and can you replicate it in a held out sample, um, there's an assumption there. And the assumption is that uh, across all the people in my sample, um, the mechanisms that give rise to those correlations are, are fundamentally similar. Um, and so our sample, um, the subtype discovery sample, was 220 people um, from two different scanners, all of whom had treatment-resistant depression of moderate to severe intensity um, and were currently actively depressed. Um, this other sample uh, had um, a mix of people with depression who were active, depression in remission, and various anxiety disorders, but no depression. Um, and I would say that a lot of the literature suggests that the mechanisms that give rise to um, anxiety in panic disorder, for example, may not all be the same as the mechanisms that give rise to anxiety in, uh, in treatment-resistant unipolar depression. And so we wanted to know, if we took a sample like theirs and pre-processed it in the same way as theirs, um, what would we observe? Um, and so I just, this is our data um, in, the, in the Drysdale paper. Um, uh, I want to highlight, by the way, Logan Grosnick, an amazing um, statistician um, and uh, neuroscientist who um, was the second author in the Drysdale paper and led this analysis. Um, he just did the same analysis in a, in a sample pre-processed like, uh, like this preprint and, um, and designed to have clinical sample characteristics um, similar to the preprint. And, and we see a very different effect. Um, so you see um, that uh, many of the symptoms no longer have um, any more than expected by chance. Um, and uh, those that do are, are have more like 1% um, on average, as opposed to something in the range of um, 1, 3, 4, or even 5%. Um, so the take home message is that uh, yes, uh, we, we think that uh, these pre-processing decisions are important and giving attention to clinical sample heterogeneity is also important. Um, but even in this sample, we, we could detect some statistically significant re, um, relationships. Um, but I would just encourage everybody like, um, to be very um, thoughtful about the sample that you're using and whether the sample is the right sample to answer the question that you're, that you're, that you're out to answer. Um, okay, that's my second main point. Good. Um, so. We did some feature selection. We found connectivity features that correlate with uh, clinical symptoms. Um, and uh, importantly, when you're doing a canonical correlation analysis, um, you, the number of features that can be included in the analysis has to be um, less than the number of subjects in your analysis. Um, and so we can't use 33,000 because we have 220 people. Um, so 
we selected um, a subset of connectivity features um, and ran CCA on those, um, and we get these um, very high correlations. Um, and like um, looking at these definitely um, gives one pause and concern that there may be some overfitting here. Um, uh, I think uh, it does not say that there, that there aren't real relationships, um, but um, those correlations are super high, um, and, and, and it probably reflects some overfitting related to the fact that we did a feature selection step first, right? So it's important to think about that. Uh, yes, uh, in the back. Y yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so uh, I, I, uh, one second, I'm gonna get there. Um, do you have another question? Similar question, um, how do you design around the way you approach feature selection and do you build yourself the optimal Yeah, so um, what we do here is we take, uh, just like we did here, we take every connectivity feature, um, 33,000 of them, and we correlate them with every symptom. There are 16. Um, there's actually 17 on the HAMD, but item 17 in our sample and in every sample I've looked at, it's insight is the, is the question. Almost everyone with depression has uh, insight intact, and they get a zero on that item, and so there's almost no variance in many bootstrap repli replicates, so we leave it out. So there are 16 items. We correlate it with every connectivity feature. Um, so we get 33,000 times 16 um, correlations, that's a lot. Um, uh, each of those um, can be converted, uh, has a T statistic associated with it and a P value. Um, and so in the Drysdale paper, we're just sorting them um, by, uh, by, by the P value or the T stat. Um, and then uh, we select increasing numbers of connectivity features. Um, and uh, we um, selected the number of connectivity features um, that, you know, from 10 up to 219 or whatever. Um, we selected uh, the number of connectivity features um, that gave us the most robust uh, canonical correlation analysis um, results. Um, uh, they can also get a p-value. Um, uh, 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 you, I'll, I'll come back to that if you're interested in um, knowing more details about exactly how that worked, but that's how the feature selection step worked, and it, and it definitely does introduce a potential for, for overfitting, and that's what I'm gonna address next. I think it's related to your question up there. Um, before, did you have a question before I move on? Okay, all right, okay. Um, so we rank the connectivity features um, and we, uh, we find um, in the Drysdale paper that, uh, that um, the way we did it there, um, that something on the order of like 80% of the number of subjects um, um, seemed to give optimal results that you got a, a, a lot of overfitting um, when you had um, more than that. Um, and less than that, you had um, lower correlations in, 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 the, in the training set. Um, but that doesn't really, uh, we wanted to ask this question in a, in a more rigorous way um, and, uh, and, and basically ask in less doubt data, um, what do the canonical correlations look like? Um, uh, that'll give you a sense of overfitting, um, the degree to which overfitting was a problem. That'll give you a sense uh, uh, of, uh, of what the optimal number of features to include is. Um, and it'll also give you a sense of like what are the um, likelihood of uh, observing what you observed um, uh, by chance. Um, and, uh, and, and what we find is depicted here. So um, here you see violin plots with box plots inside them. They're like, it's easier to see. In blue, this is the training sample. In green, this is the test sample. Um, we do this a thousand times. Um, you select, I, I want to say, 63% uh, of the data. Um, don't ask why that seems to be the magical number for statisticians, but it does. Um, select some subsample of the data. Do what I just said. Um, uh, run the CCA. Um, ask what is the um, correlation between the um, first pair of canonical variates. Um, repeat a thousand times um, and compare that in the, uh, in the training sample and the test sample. And what I want you to pay attention to mostly is the box plot um, within um, the violin plot, which tells you like the median correlation in the, in the held out data, um, and also uh, the range that you see um, over, um, over iterations. Um, and here we have the, the number of features that we, that we used in the CCA. Um, and what you can see, just looking at the blue violin plots, they go up and they plateau very high, right? Um, towards the end, like right around 200, I guess here, yeah, because uh, 
something around 190 was the maximum number of features that could be included given the number of subjects um, in, the, in the training sample. Um, something around that number, um, they begin to become very unstable. Um, but like just shy of that number, similar to what we observed in Drysdale, um, they, they like plateau um, and the correlation is very high um, and it's almost, and it's clearly overfits because uh, when you look at the correlations, um, you can just look at the median, I suppose. Um, in the held out data, um, they exhibit a different pattern. Um, they peak around uh, 20 features. Um, this one is the highest. Um, and then they go down um, and, uh, and overall like, like here, um, the last three, the last four, um, the, even the box plot um, overlaps zero. So that tells you a lot of overfitting there. Um, um, that's not to say, again, that there aren't real canonical correlations. What it tells you is that uh, the, the model coefficients that you've used are overfit to the sample that they were, that they were trained on. But there is a solution to this. Um, and that solution um, is in applying just a little bit of regularization. Um, and so uh, regularization um, basically penalizes the models so that most coefficients are pushed towards zero. Um, uh, and uh, um, not many correlation, not, not many coefficients are going to be um, highly positive or negative. Um, and it turns out, we've, statisticians have known this for a long time, that this kind of regularization is uh, useful for improving stability both in regressions and in, and in CCA like this. Um, and, and we were really pleasantly just surprised that even just a little bit of regularization did a lot to improve stability one sec. Um, and you can see that here, uh, like um, with uh, the smallest number of features we tried, 10. Um, the training sample uh, correlation median was like 0.55. The test sample was 0.5. Um, we could improve all the way out to uh, 190. Um, uh, and uh, here, the like test, the, the training sample correlation median is like point, uh, I want to say 0.8 or 0.9. Um, and the, uh, the test is like 0.75. So, um, so good stability with a little bit of regularization. Um, I think, again, that, um, that shows that the relationships are real. Um, but if you want to use the actual CCA space um, in new data, which um, we didn't do in Drysdale, um, uh, but it could be very useful, um, some regularization is a really important thing to do here. Um, uh, I think that's the take-home message there. Um, and I definitely encourage everybody, if you're doing something like this, um, regularization seems um, super helpful. Um, yes? So a quick question about the number of features. I, I think I heard you saying that you need to select from 3,000 a functional sensitivity for features. But my computation shows that you have more than 30,000 sensitivity. I said, I said 33,000. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, more like the first one. Um, it's uh, so um, yeah. So it's a regularization of both. Turned out not. So we tried regularizing um, the uh, connectivity features, not the not the correlation matrix. Um, so actually, I'm not sure. I I'll, I'll tell you what we did, <laughs> and hopefully this will answer your question. Um, so we have the bold signal time series. We um, we calculate correlations between each pair of regions, and that gives us. Um, what I am calling resting state functional connectivity, connectivity features. Um, we correlate each connectivity feature with every clinical symptom, um, and that gives us a rank ordered list. Um, and then we select uh, the top 10, the top 20, the top 30, et cetera. Um, and the regularization applies to either the connectivity features or the clinical symptoms or both. And, uh, and, and what you see here is uh, both. Um, and the clinical symptom regularization actually didn't matter a great deal. What really helped was the connectivity feature regularization. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so it, what really helps is the regularization of the functional connectivity features, even ignoring completely the symptoms. That's yes. It. Yeah. And it kind of makes sense uh, intuitively that, like, the overfitting problem probably relates to the... Uh, the measures of which there are 33,000 as opposed to the 16 clinical symptom measures. Um, um, it, like, 
uh, I think an intuitive way to understand this is like, um, you have to remember, and we correct for this, um, didn't talk about that, the connectivity features themselves, many of them are highly correlated. Um, the clinical symptoms are a little bit too, like people with a lot of anhedonia tend to be a little more anxious, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the connectivity features, many of them are very correlated because they come, they're derived from brain regions that are functionally related to each other, often right next to each other. Um, and so when you have a lot of correlated features um, and you take 187 people, um, what you're gonna get uh, sometimes, depending on who those people are, um, like some of those connectivity features are gonna get like really high weights. Um, and it's not because they're so much more important than the others, it's just because um, uh, in this particular sample, um, by chance, they happen to have a, a big impact. Um, uh, and so regularization um, helps with this. Um, that's what it was designed for, is, is helping to deal with um, many uh, correlated features to yield um, more stable results, um, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, think about re regularization is my last me message um, if, you're, if you're doing something like this. Um, and I think uh, we're supposed to stop at 2.30? Okay, let me see. If, yeah, that time, time went by quickly here. Let me just see if there's anything else. Yeah, those are actually like, I mean, I, I think I got through most of my most important messages here. Um, I, I, I had some additional slides more on like uh, a vision forward for how you might use this approach, um, integrating it with optogenetic fMRI um, to like take the neuroimaging data in humans, formulate hypotheses about which circuits might be important for which symptoms. Um, and then Rose and I were talking about something like this. Um, um, can you then uh, test some of those hypotheses um, at least indirectly in an animal um, and, and really establish whether like altering function in this circuit actually does what you think it might do to a particular behavior. Um, and if you're interested in all that, uh, you can come and ask me about it at the end. I think in the interest of time, I'll just um, stop at that. Yeah, um, so I'll tell you what we did um, because I, you know, I can describe what we did and I, I know, and, and I don't fully know um, for sure what are the most important variables I don't think anyone does yet contributing to scanner related differences. Um, what we did was um, regress on dummy variables um, for scanner um, as well as um, all of the other data quality corrections that I, that I did describe, mostly related to motion. Um, I, I also said like signal to noise. So we looked, it, um, we, we asked uh, for every subject in every ROI, what's the mean signal to noise um, in that ROI? And if it was less than uh, um, 100, um, we um, flagged that as a problem. Um, and for subjects who had um, less than 100 in more than X percent of the um, ROIs, and I don't exactly remember what that percent was, it was, it was fairly small, um, we don't use that subject at all. Um, uh, and I think scanner-related differences in signal to noise in particular brain regions definitely have an influence on the, on the, on the measures, right? Because if your head coil is different, um, you might get different measures. Uh, that's one thing, signal to noise. A second thing, um, motion actually also, um, I, I know this now because I've looked at um, like dozens of different scanners. Um, uh, I had the privilege to be able to do that. Um, uh, motion also varies by scanner, and I don't know why. Um, maybe the, like the scanner tech is better at like comforting the person. Um, maybe the, maybe the pillow in the scanner is just like more or less comfortable. Um, maybe there's something about the people at the scanner. Um, I don't know, but but motion varies systematically by scanner often too, and so correcting for that helps. And then lastly, um, we uh, we regress on dummy variables um, for, for scanner um, uh, in our healthy controls. And that I think is also important because um, if the clinical characteristics of your sample differ across the different sites, then, then correcting for site-related differences might actually be correcting for um, clinical um, variation. Um, and so 
we had lots of healthy controls, um, and so we, we used that to correct um, for scanner-related differences. And after doing the SNR and the motion correction, there weren't actually a ton of scanner-related differences. Um, but if you don't do that, uh, we do see a lot, and lots of people have seen that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I think, again, um, many of the same pitfalls I just described for the CCA also apply to the machine learning. Um, I think, like, the, uh, I guess the three things that stand out in my mind off the, off the cuff are, um, are uh, making sure that everything, um, it's easy to miss something, um, that everything in your training sample is completely separate from your test sample. Um, Including the feature selection part, yeah, for sure, that's maybe one of the most important things to have be separate from the from the test sample. But also like uh, like um, uh, like the CCA. Like um, if you if you do the CCA um, on all the subjects um, and then uh, you do everything else separate after that, the test sample isn't truly independent anymore of the training sample. So making sure they are really truly independent is really important. That's one thing. Uh, I think it's good to do like not just leave one out cross validation, which is what we reported here, but like uh, you know like um, uh, fivefold, tenfold, twentyfold, and leave one out or something like that, and 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 you sh you should see some uh, you know relationship, but um, and 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 make sure that uh, that um, that you're not overestimating the the, the performance results, um, and. Uh, and, and then, like the, the third one would be like being uh, thoughtful about the about the feature selection step and how that influences the probability of observing what you actually observe. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so with the feature selection, uh, did you do that also with the leave one out uh, training iteration, or did you just do it once with uh, a test set and then? So what we report in the paper um, for simplicity is leave one out, um, but we, we also did, it might actually be in the paper, it was in an earlier one version for sure. Um, uh, we definitely did, like I just said, um, five-fold, ten-fold, twenty-fold, and, and leave one out. Um, and yes, the feature selection step is um, always just done in the training sample, and then that feature is used in the test sample. Yeah. And you should make iterations, and then how did you choose which features to carry on with once you decided on the optimal number of feature variations? Yeah. Um, so uh, I actually like had yeah fair panels that I cut um, showing that um, like uh, the uh, we've looked at this mainly in the context of the of the CCA um, and uh, how stable are the features that are selected? Um, and as you'd kind of expect, the the particular features that are selected. Um, aren't so stable without the regularization. Um, and that um, is probably because you're taking 33,000, um, you're selecting 150 or something like that. Um, and all of those 150 and the next 150 and the next 400 probably um, have uh, like p values of 10 to the minus seventh or something. Um, and, uh, and, and so like their particular rank order um, could vary a lot. Um, uh, regularization helped a lot with that. Um, so, like, as a, like, I, I, I want to say a, a, about 80% um, of the features that ended up getting selected um, were selected in um, all or almost all of our, uh, of our um, uh, rounds, iterations. Um, so regularization helped with the stability of the feature selection, although I don't think that like actually means so much biologically. Um, it just um, helps avoid overfitting. You know, they're they're highly correlated, and that probably is um, why the, the selected features are unstable.
Yeah, um, so this is from a new unpublished work. It wasn't in the Drysdale paper. Um, and uh, I think, um, so the way this is done, you can um, have uh, more, more than 220 um, uh, connectivity features um, um, with, the, with the regular ICCA. Um, and uh, and I, think it, I think what we would expect to see is if we takes a, um, it, so every time you run this analysis, um, we do it on Amazon Web Services, um, and uh, it takes about two days. <laughs> um, and uh, I think what I would like to do with more time is keep on adding features, and I think what we would eventually see is, uh, is a peak. Um, um, if we didn't, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what I would do. I need to think about that further. Yeah. Probably smaller number is better. Yep, um, so at, great, great, great question, great idea. Um, at, at the, the data I presented very quickly at the end of the last talk, looking at differential treatment response prediction, that was that, basically. So we use the subtype diagnosis, but it is just one of the features that we're, that we're using as predictors. Um, and for sure, mm -hmm. if your goal is to predict treatment response, that's the way to do it. Um, it's not like I wouldn't recommend, like, this is a broader principle, I think, like, you, you know, you, the, all of the decisions I just mentioned, like, um, the, the decision you make is going to be informed by what the goal of your analysis is. Um, and, uh, and if your goal is just to predict treatment response, then what you want to be modeling is um, predictors of treatment response, not necessarily, because maybe predictors of some clinical symptoms just aren't important in predicting treatment response. Yeah, great yeah. point. Well, then, I think... Uh, that's probably Great. pretty much it. Um, yes, I want to say another thank you. Thank you. Uh, for a very grueling day for, uh, for poor Dr. Liston with two talks back to back and a, and a really fast mouthful of sandwich in the middle. Um, we do have a break now, and hopefully there's some, some coffee outside, so please take the opportunity to, uh, to ask him any additional questions you might have. And I would really like to thank him again for two wonderful presentations. That's why I taped this anyway, so. Okay. Um, hi, I'm glad everyone's staying <laughs> to join us.